I can report right at this moment here that there is a coordinated 50 basis point global rate cut. We made the diagnosis that this was big, this was serious. If we wanted to do more, we certainly could do it. And the amount of guilt which is out there is increasing all the time. There's a sense out there that, quote, quantitative easing or asset purchases has become a completely foreign, new, unstrange kind of thing. Quite the contrary, this is just monetary policy. The ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. I think whatever actions we take have to be one way. We can't sort of bring it down, then bring it up. Many uh, central banks in Asia have uh, tightened uh, monetary policy. The committee decided, starting next month, to modestly reduce the pace at which it is increasing the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. For the first time in a long time, you don't have to be an optimist to see the glass is half full. Is it premature? for us to describe this crisis as now being over. The recovery is, is there, but it's weak, it's modest. I have always consulted closely with Janet. She fully supports what we did today. I would like to see monetary policy first and foremost uh, directed toward achieving those goals Congress has given us. So welcome everybody to this uh, live CNBC debate on the future of monetary policy. We're coming to you from the Congress Centre in Davos at the World Economic Forum. The Fed has uh, really uh, thrown a rock in the pond in some senses when it comes to the monetary policy outlook by announcing the start of tapering. The world is beginning to ask questions about the normalization process for monetary policy and interest rates. But is it the Fed alone who can head off down this road towards the exit? Or are there other central banks now that can also start to think about normalization? And if that is the case, what are the consequences for other economies around the world? And what does that mean for the way we think about the next phase of monetary policy? I'm Jeff Cutmore. Welcome to this debate over the next hour. Let me introduce our panel to you. And I'd like to start with the UK Chancellor, George Osborne, who appointed Mark Carney to the Bank of England, understanding if, the, if you want any UK team to deliver, you need to put a foreign manager in charge. <laughs> and now the UK has falling inflation, falling unemployment, and clear evidence of a growth pickup. Bank of Japan Governor Haruhiko Kuroda. If Prime Minister Abe is firing the arrows, then Mr Kuroda is sharpening the tips and picking out the targets. Former US Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, who had us all dashing back to our post-war textbooks to understand why secular stagnation means the challenge for central banks and governments remains to reverse years of underinvestment in people and infrastructure. Alexander Tombini, Governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, no doubt pleased to see his programme of interest rate rises appears to be slowing inflation in Brazil. But like any good defender in this World Cup year, won't rest until that threat <laughs> has been soundly defeated. <laughs> and I want to wrap up with Thomas Jordan. Uh, Thomas uh, heads up the Swiss National Bank. Um, he has warned about the risk of central banks having very large balance sheets. Now, that's a message that will resonate with the 26 cantons that are members of the bank who will not get a payout this year because of the fall in the gold price. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our panel for our live debate. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Osborne, I, I had another question for you, but within the last 24 hours, um, your appointed central bank governor has 
led us down the road to thinking that forward guidance um, now changes in significance for the UK um, and that this 7% unemployment threshold may not be as important to markets as we were led to believe. Firstly, can I ask you, um, what is your take on what Mr Carney has said as his boss? And secondly, if, if that now means that forward guidance and the way we understand it has changed, what has forward guidance achieved for the UK economy? Well, first of all, I'm not his boss. Uh, I appointed him, but uh, yeah. Mark is, uh, of course, independent, and he's uh, part of an independent monetary policy committee. And as, as the finance minister on the panel, I need to start with that health warning that uh, uh, the decisions on monetary policy are for the MPC. Uh, but I, I've made these two observations. I mean, first, I make a general observation. We're talking here, and, and you've set up this debate as a debate about exit from exceptionally supportive monetary policy. You know, that in itself is a mark of success. That is a mark of a number of economies that have uh, started to see the recovery take off. Uh, and we're not in the kind of gloomy debate that I remember here at Davos and elsewhere uh, a year ago. And that points to a second observation I make, which is monetary policy works. Uh, the uh, exceptionally supportive monetary policy in the United Kingdom, the US, Japan and elsewhere that has worked and I think uh, confounded some of those who said it was never going to work and we needed a whole range of other things. Uh, now, in the United Kingdom, the re only reason we're now discussing what happens uh, is because unemployment is falling rapidly in 7.1%. Uh, the forward guidance that the MPC uh, issued First of all, sets as a threshold 7%, not 7.1%, so uh, we are not there yet. And uh, second, you know, they made it very clear, Mark made it very clear in the last 24 hours, it is not a trigger for action, it is a, a threshold. Uh, and he's clear uh, that uh, there's not, in his words, not a need for an immediate rise in interest rates. And uh, the MPC will do some further analysis and work, and they've got an inflation report in February. But you know, we're only, again, having this discussion because there is a recovery underway, because unemployment is falling. While I have you here, if I can just focus on the UK for a moment. Take on board everything that you say, but there will be those who look at the composition of that growth and say, look, the savings rate has fallen, the housing market has been reignited, but we haven't seen a rapid increase in exports, we haven't seen a dramatic rise in productivity. This is bubbly growth that the UK is experiencing. The UK is still not an economy that is in good balance. But I'm the first to say the job is not done. It's not even half done. Uh, there is uh, the, a lot of the recovery has been supported by the consumer, but it is income generated consumption rather than debt uh, fueled consumption. I think a big challenge for policymakers in the UK now is to try and see a handover to business investment and exports. Uh, as key components of economic recovery. And when you, when you mention the housing market and, and other things like that, you know, well, maybe we can discuss this later. You know, I think one of the interesting things about the United Kingdom at the moment is we have a, perhaps the most sort of formalized and innovative macro prudential regime where we've created a financial policy committee in the Bank of England. And Mark and his team at the bank have a whole range of tools. They don't just have interest rates. They now have a whole range of macro tools, including capital weights and the like. And if they see a problem in housing, and Mark's clear, you know, he doesn't see a problem today, uh, but if they see a problem in housing, they've got a range of quite subtle and targeted tools. And that is part of a very radical change to the monetary policy framework which we have created in the United Kingdom. So you're sleeping easy at night? Well, look, I, there's a huge amount to be done to recover the damage of the Great Recession and to make sure we don't make the mistakes of the past, have a more balanced UK and indeed Western uh, economic growth story. Mr. Corroder, if I can come to you. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Abe came here and made a, a, a wonderful speech about how Japan now has broken through this ceiling of deflation mm -hmm. and that we can expect better things from the Japanese economy. Mm -hmm. But the economists I know who watch your economy mm -hmm. are scratching their head about the sales tax. Mm -hmm. Now it seems you're heading off in one direction, mm -hmm. trying to stimulate demand mm -hmm. and the government, mm -hmm. through the introduction of another sales tax, mm -hmm. appears to be taking us in mm -hmm. a different direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a contradiction? Mm -hmm. And should we fear that the introduction of the sales tax later mm -hmm. this year mm -hmm. will have the same outcome mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. previous attempts to introduce a sales tax? 
Uh, my short answer is uh, uh, sales tax hike uh, does not uh, create any additional uh, sort of uh, problem to the Japanese economy. Uh, why? Because when we uh, decided and introduced uh, the new monetary policy framework last April, uh, that is the so-called quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, uh, to, uh, for instance, double uh, monetary base in two years, double the amount of uh, uh, government bonds held by the Bank of Japan in two years, and so on and so forth. Uh, at that time, uh, already the law to raise sales tax in two stages uh, had been uh, approved by the Diet. So, when we decided a new monetary framework, we did uh, take into account the temporary negative impact of such tax hike on the economy. And we introduced the new uh, monetary policy framework, QQE, uh, to overcome uh, the 15 year long deflation and also overcome potential negative impact of uh, tax increase or whatever uh, kind of uh, uh, shocks uh, are likely to uh, affect the Japanese economy. And uh, after uh, nine months uh, uh, of uh, implementing uh, the QQE, uh, the economy is on track. Uh, currently, the economy is growing uh, close to 3%. And even after uh, the sales tax hike in two stages uh, takes, uh, uh, takes place, uh, takes place uh, uh, this year as well as mid next year, uh, the economy will continue to uh, grow, uh, maybe around 1.5 uh, or 1.5%, one, one which is uh, well uh, above uh, the Japanese economy's uh, uh, medium term potential growth, rate, which is below 1%. So, uh, as I said at the outset, uh, we know the tax hike uh, in two stages, and we uh, introduced very uh, substantial uh, uh, monetary uh, uh, easing, and uh, we, at this stage, uh, envisage no uh, uh, additional negative impact but, coming from Japan. But will it be reversed mm -hmm. rapidly if, mm -hmm. if it does appear to have a drag on, on mm -hmm. demand? Mm -hmm. it, is there the prospect that it could be reversed quickly I, I think if there is a drag on demand? As, as you can imagine, whenever sales tax is raised, uh, before that time, uh, uh, household may increase uh, spending. And uh, after uh, sales tax is raised, uh, household may reduce uh, spending. We will see such kind of uh, uh, rise and, and, and fall of uh, consumption uh, around the time of, uh, of uh, tax increase. But those uh, uh, phenomena we have already taken into account. Okay. And also the government has uh, introduced um, various measures to ameliorate, mitigate the impact. On the economy. Since you are now the swing price setter for the JGB, mm -hmm. um, am I going to make money in JGBs this year? <laughs> uh, or, course, or do I have to take some pain for the Japanese government's sake? Of course, uh, uh, investment is, uh, is, uh, is a decision by, by investors. Um, at this stage, uh, uh, as I said, the QQE is on track and uh, consumer price inflation uh, excluding fresh food, uh, has already reached 1.2%. And uh, consumer price inflation, excluding all food stuff and energy items, also uh, has reached 0.6%. Uh, uh, so we are on sort of uh, halfway towards 2% inflation target. Uh, despite this, this development, the long-term interest rate, for instance, 10-year JGB, interest rate still remain around 0.6%. Uh, 
What was I thinking? Seeking investment advice from a central banker. <laughs> let, me, let me move on. Um, we'll, we'll have more chance to talk about this, Mr. Kuroda, but I do want to move on. Yeah. Um, Larry Summers, um, I, I think you intrigued and fascinated the world at the end of last year by bringing back this idea of secular stagnation. Um, if you look at 2013, what did the S&P deliver about? 30% just off that, but I don't see many headlines on new roads built in America or new bridges built. So on that basis, what actually did QE achieve? Oh, look, we are in a very different situation than we were just four years ago. If you looked at the fall of 2008 and the winter of 2009, they were worse by almost any measure than the fall of 1929 and the winter of 1930. And for all the various challenges we are going to discuss, the forthcoming four, the four, last four years have been nothing like the 1929 to 1933 period. That is a tribute to uh, the quality of policy and leadership uh, around uh, the world. Uh, I believe President Obama made an important contribution, but there were major steps taken in many other parts of the world that were crucial. And I think it's a particular thing worth highlighting, sort of a dog that didn't bark. If anyone had described how serious the economic problems were going to be, people would have expected much more of an outbreak of protectionism than we've seen in the world. And while there are certainly problems, we didn't see it over the last four years. Uh, I might give our British friends uh, credit for the London summit in uh, March of 2009, where that principle was established. All of that said, recovery has certainly not been everything most of us hoped uh, it would be. The US economy, for example, has gained essentially nothing on previous estimates of its potential. Our growth has only been sufficient to keep up with population growth and normal productivity uh, growth. And performance hasn't been that good in uh, other parts of the industrial world. And that is what has led me uh, to a deep concern about the nature of structural changes in the industrial world. Part of it is the consequences of long-term recession. Uh, less capital investment, people who've been out of work for two years have a very difficult time coming back uh, to uh, work, what economists refer to as hysteresis effects. Part of it is a concern about our ability to have sound growth that is also financially uh, sustainable, given the current structure of our economies. I look back, and again, I'm somewhat a prisoner of the US experience, at our expansion before this crisis, between, say, 2003 and 2006. We did grow at an adequate rate. The unemployment rate did come down. But there was no inflation. There was no overheating. And that was in the face of a massive credit bubble huge erosion of credit standards, and entirely unsustainable behavior in the housing market. And so the question arises, are we capable, without more structural spur to spending, of having a expansion that is both robust and sufficiently bubble free to be sustainable. Well, let me and ask that's you. why I've emphasized, that's why I have said so much so often in the United States that we need to promote uh, public uh, investment. Well, let's come back to that in just a moment because I want to pick up on the point you made there. What opportunity to do that when it looks as though we're about to head into another round of head banging in the US political scene as we bang our heads against this debt ceiling. I mean, it seems that that's flaring up again. Are you optimistic or pessimistic that there will be a more sensible resolution of the debate this time around? We will not see the kind of brinkmanship we've seen uh, in the past. I am very, I, I'm very optimistic that the political actors in the United States have learned that that does not serve uh, any of their purposes. 
What I'm less optimistic about is that we will move beyond a focus on the budget deficit to the other deficits that I believe are holding back our country. The public investment uh, deficit, I mean, most of the people in this room have been to Kennedy Airport. And I would just ask you the question, if a moment when we can borrow money for 30 years in the 3% range in a currency we print ourselves and the construction unemployment rate is in double digits, if that is not the moment to fix Kennedy Airport, when will that moment ever come? <laughs> and you laugh. You laugh and it's at one level funny, but at another level it is tragic that we are bequeathing to our children a deficit in the form of massive deferred maintenance on our infrastructure. We lead the world in the life sciences at a moment of unprecedented promise in the life sciences and we are spending 25% less on research in the life sciences than we were five years ago. Okay. Well, that is a deficit with huge human consequences <laughs> as well. well and so we'll I think our concept of deficits needs to move beyond just the accumulation of financial debt to the other deficits we bequeath to our children's generation. Excellent. Um, Governor Tom Beeney, let me, let me come to you. Um, uh, Lady Fortune seems to have favoured the developed world through this recent phase of the recovery from the crisis. Um, on top of concerns about uh, the fiscal position of a, a number of companies, the fragile five that we constantly hear about, um, we have tapering, we have um, a sell-off in emerging <coughs> currencies overnight, um, particular concerns about Argentina. You are Brazil, not Argentina, but to a certain extent, people will sell Brazil on the basis of the same story. How concerned are you that your efforts at the moment to manage inflation and growth in the Brazilian economy get swept up in this stampede for the exit because people are worried that tapering is a bad story for the emerging world? Thank you, Jeff. I think uh, Brazil, the Central Bank of Brazil was one of the first to say that at the end of the day, the beginning of tapering is a net positive for the global economy, for international trade, therefore for emerging markets, including Brazil. So when we go through the normalization process, we will have a positive for, for a country like Brazil. Uh, so we should not get confused in the process that this change in relative prices that has happened since the beginning of talks about normalization, this is part of the process. I mean, it's important to have change in relative prices as we move forward to make sure that the normalization global financial conditions work for, for everyone, for the emerging markets, but also for the advanced economies. And Brazil has responded to this new global financial condition in a very classical way. We have tightened policies, of course, we were tightening before the discussion began because we are addressing domestic issues, we are fighting inflation, but this is part of the adjustment and we are doing that. We also have in Brazil exchange rate flexibility and the real has moved since the beginning, so this is part of the, the process. And the third leg of this classical response is the fact that we accumulated buffers over the years to allow us to sort of smooth out the process of changing the relative price without having major impacts in the real economy. We are doing that. It's working. You mentioned at the beginning that uh, inflation is, is coming down. Yes, from the peak and just after we started the tightening process, we have been able to lower inflation by one full percentage point. So we still need uh, to move forward in this direction, but it's working. Of course, the weakening of the real during the process militates yep. against uh, the whole thing, but uh, the latest figures that we see from inflation at least uh, give us the, uh, so, so the, the response that monetary policy, like uh, Mr. Osborne just said, yes. works also in Brazil. So, so, so let me ask you, in a, in a low return world where you have interest rates at 10% supporting the real and the real is still being sold, do you worry that the rest of the world misunderstands the robustness of the Brazilian economy 
or is there another story that we need to discuss? I think the AI was one of the, the currencies that uh, appreciated the most during the sort of the, uh, when the incentives were being put forward in the advanced economies. So now the chain relative price is part of the process. So I don't think there is misunderstanding. We are able to do that in a, in a way that uh, will benefit the economy after all. So and we have the buffers, I was just saying, we use part of the buffers sort of to smooth out the process, but the exchange rate has moved. And uh, I think this is, uh, this is no misunderstanding, it's part of the, the whole adjustment process. Um, Governor Jordan, if I can come to you here. Um, you have stood out, I think, uh, in many senses, um, as taking a different tack to the Anglo-Saxon uh, central bank Mm -hmm. You have said that you don't think forward guidance is necessarily the appropriate tool to manage um, markets' expectations about interest rates. Why is that the case? What's wrong with forward <coughs> guidance? Well, there's nothing wrong with uh, forward guidance. Uh, I just said that, in fact, every country has to choose a concept that uh, really is appropriate for the situation of the country itself. In our case, I believe you have to have a simple concept. The exchange rate is really at the moment at the center of this uh, concept. And you have to be careful not to have too many conditions with forward guidance in order not to confuse markets. So that was uh, the is this, message. Is, is this the trap that other central banks may have now got themselves into? He looks pointedly at George Osborne. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do not comment here on, on all the central banks' uh, policy. I just would like to raise a point with respect to the Swiss National Bank. So we are in a complex situation. Switzerland, especially the Swiss franc, remains a safe haven currency. So we had this massive appreciation and we had to introduce the minimum exchange rate. And there we need a very simple and very clear policy. So clear message to the market is absolutely essential for the success of such a policy. Um, <clears throat> now I'm a, a, a man of a, a, a small brain and a simple mind, but if you set a <laughs> target ceiling on the um, Swiss euro, or the Euro Swissy, as it's generally referred to, um, isn't that a form of forward guidance? Because you've basically well, told the market yeah. that this is where it where yeah. it goes, and you're not going to breach it because yeah. we will take you on in the marketplace if you try. Well, everything is a question about definition, so uh, <laughs> you can in interpret also this as a forward guidance. We say, in fact, the minimum exchange rate remains as long as necessary. We have to <clears> ensure <throat> adequate monetary conditions, and for the time being. Of course, this is uh, the minimum exchange rate. You've also talked about um, the risks of having inflated central bank balance sheets. And obviously, in the introduction, I mentioned that you won't be paying out to the cantons. Um, is it possible, do you think, um, without very strong growth, that central banks are going to be able to work off some of this accumulated uh, debt that sits on balance sheets now? Well, the size of the balance sheet is the consequence of monetary policy. So central banks should not worry too much about the size of the balance sheet. So in our case, we have to ensure adequate monetary conditions. If an increase of the balance sheet is necessary, this is the case. And uh, <clears throat> we should accept it. Also, we do not have the goal or even the mandate to provide profit to the government but rather to ensure the adequate monetary conditions. And if there are some changes at the gold price or other asset uh, prices, and if that leads to a situation where a central bank uh, makes losses, that should not be the reason to change monetary policy. The focus should really be on having adequate conditions in order uh, to fulfill the mandate. Right, so that was my quick fire round. Um, let's move into the, uh, the conversation at large. And, and Mr. Corrado, I want to start with that point because how worried or aware are you of balance sheet risk in the mm -hmm. Japanese context? Because you, you seem to have been very aggressively getting engaged mm -hmm. in purchasing treasuries. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, as uh, Chancellor Osborne uh, indicated or argued, uh, normalization uh, or exiting from uh, non-conventional or whatever monetary policies uh, means success of, this, of the policy. Now, as I said before, our new monetary policy framework, uh, so-called QQE, started just nine months ago. And uh, at that time, we uh, declared that we 
aim at achieving 2% inflation target basically in two years' time. Uh, Time-wise, uh, we are only halfway. And also, inflation rate-wise, I mean 1.2% inflation, still only halfway. Uh, there's a long way to go. So at this stage, for Japan, it's somewhat premature to discuss in concrete terms how to exit, how to normalize the current uh, uh, monetary policy uh, when uh, the 2% uh, differential target is uh, achieved or approached. Uh, however, I can assure you that, uh, that uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, been discussing uh, various options, uh, possibilities, and so on and so forth. And we have been carefully watching how other central banks, including Federal Reserve, have been managing uh, normalization process. By the way, I think uh, Federal Reserve has managed uh, uh, normalization process uh, fairly well, uh, tapering off decision has not uh, disrupted the market at all. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, for Japan, uh, it's premature to discuss in concrete terms uh, normalization or exiting from the QQE. Uh, but uh, I can assure you that uh, we are careful and we will manage uh, such normalization process uh, uh, smoothly uh, and without disrupting the market or without uh, creating any balance sheet problem for uh, uh, financial systems, as well as uh, the central bank. Itself. Well, you're very generous to mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve because mm -hmm. I think it was second time round ultimately, <laughs> wasn't it? Because they blinked yeah. when they had the first opportunity to begin tapering back. Mm -hmm. but, but Larry Summers, uh, as you look at the US economy, um, there are still question marks about the strength and sustainability of this rebound and whether the, the Federal Reserve has actually embarked a little too early on this process of tapering because inevitably the money markets then begin to reprice the cost of money in the money markets themselves. I know the Fed can continually <coughs> tells us this is about tapering, it's not about raising interest rates, but inevitably people are going to draw their own conclusion here. So I wonder if you could just give us the benefit of, of your thought of whether this process has started too soon and whether we might actually see it reversed this year if growth turns out to be weaker than anticipated. You know, I think all central banks always are data dependent and the Federal Reserve has certainly made clear that its trajectory of policy will be uh, data dependent. And certainly uh, the range of variation we've seen in unemployment in both the United States and the UK, favorable uh, range in both uh, cases, reminds us that uh, historical relationships in economics are way short of ironclad laws and that policy inevitably <clears throat> will involve discretion uh, in, response, uh, to, in response to events. I think the Federal Reserve has been right in emphasizing uh, in recent years that uh, the bias of policy at a time when unemployment is above any reasonable expectation and inflation is below uh, any reasonable target level has to be towards expansion. I think that's been the correct animating judgment for monetary policy. I think the judgment that not all the expansionary impulse can prudently come from monetary policy and therefore it's appropriate to avoid excessive fiscal contraction and therefore it's appropriate to find ways of supporting investment-led recovery in both the housing and the business sectors. I think those have been appropriate uh, areas of uh, emphasis uh, by, the Federal, by the Federal Reserve System. Would I preclude the possibility of a slowdown? No, but that's because uh, experience teaches that precluding possibilities is always 
a uh, mistake with respect to uh, formulating uh, economic policy. I think we are reminded by events of just how great the uncertainties are. Can I stop you on that yes. and just move on? Because I think that's a neat point, just to end the point that you were making. And I, I want to bring this to you, Chancellor Osborne. Recently, you've um, talked about an increase of the minimum wage in the UK, and you've mm. made the point that companies should not expect to make profits from the welfare system in the UK. Now, we've talked a lot here about how much money is on company balance sheets. Mm. And in a sense, we wouldn't need such aggressive QE if companies themselves were willing to put that money back mm. into the economy. Why, when we have almost reached the Bank of England's threshold on unemployment, and clearly most measures of growth for the economy are improving, mm. do we not see the confidence in the business community to start investing? Mm. Well, I'd make a couple of points here. First of all, where I agree with what uh, Larry Summers was saying earlier is that I think there is an infrastructure deficit and countries like the UK and the US should be investing in science and life sciences as the example he gave. I would say, first of all, when it comes to public investment and public uh, infrastructure projects, I would just say there's no free lunch. You have to make tough decisions elsewhere in your budget on entitlements in the case of the UK uh, in order to deal with that deficit. The, you've got, you know, the UK still has one of the higher deficits. And uh, I think you can address Larry's point of what Western countries need to be doing, investing in infrastructure, investing in science, making structural changes, but not do it at the expense of credible fiscal policy. And without credible fiscal policy, as many countries close to the United Kingdom learnt uh, in recent years, your monetary policy becomes completely ineffective uh, and your market rates go up and the like. So, you know, I don't disagree with the outcome that Larry talks about. I just think that you've got to make the hard choices if you're the finance minister about how you're going to pay for it. Um, that brings then to the second point, because it's related and it comes to your question. Uh, it, ultimately, businesses will invest when they have confidence in the future prospects of that economy and uh, confidence that their investment is going to uh, generate a return. Understandably, particularly in the European continent, where we had a near-death experience with one of the world's largest currencies, the euro, uh, people have been very risk-averse. And uh, companies, company boards would much rather sit on the cash. Now, one of the things we've got to do is convince businesses that we've got credible frameworks, whether in monetary policy, fiscal policy, and the like, uh, that we're making supply-side reforms to things like planning, so you can actually um, see those investments go ahead. Uh, and, and I think then the investment will flow. Uh, and I think ultimately, you, you know, the, you can't force a, a company in a free market to make an investment, but you can do everything you can to create the conditions in which that investment makes good business sense. Uh, and when I said right at the beginning that what I want to see in the UK, and you know, I think this would apply to other Western uh, economies, is a handover to investment, <coughs> to exports. Uh, that is precisely you know, the challenge for policymaking, create the framework in which those things can happen. But just to come back to this, um, businessmen don't invest because they don't have confidence. Absolutely. So what is it that they're scared of? Is it that they don't believe the policy framework that the Bank of England has laid out to achieve its targets, and now we see this little wobble on forward guidance, or are they concerned about the longevity of your own government and the fact that you may not be around to follow through on some of the fiscal <laughs> policy that you've implemented. Well, I have a very strong interest in the uh, survival of my government. The, uh, the, um, no, look, I, I think, uh, you know, first of all, on full guidance, you keep saying, you know, things like um, the, the wobble and to quote you. You know, I, don't, I think that's being unfair. Well, we thought it was a very important no, I, I, policy tool. I don't, I don't think and it's now a, we learn it's just one of many no, no, and we, I think need, we don't need to worry being, so much about the I think the you're threshold. being unfair to the Bank of England. You know, they, they set a a threshold of unemployment, and thanks to the success of policy, both uh, Bank of England policy and, and government policy, unemployment is falling very quickly, and so people are talking about what comes next. As I say, that's a kind of challenge of success rather than a, a problem or a failure, if, if you like. Um, second, I think business investment. You know, there is evidence, and you know, we have an independent forecaster in the United Kingdom that is mm -hmm. forecasting uh, an increase in business investment. You know, I think you are beginning to see investment. You're certainly in the UK seeing huge inward investment 
you know, countries like China and Chinese businesses are choosing the UK, UK as the go-to destination in the West for investment. I think that's because they do see political stability, uh, you know, a credible monetary and macroprudential framework, a credible fiscal policy, absolutely uh, central, and an effort to undertake supply-side reform. So, you know, for example, we're a country saying, yes, let's uh, build nuclear power stations. Plenty of other governments in the world don't want to take on that challenge. We're prepared to, we're saying yes to fracking in the United Kingdom because we've seen what it's done in the US and indeed in other places. Uh, there are plenty of other Western governments that don't want to touch fracking because it's too hot to handle. You know, I think we're prepared to take the difficult decisions that will allow the investment to flow. Larry Summers, I just wonder for a moment if you want to come back on that um, and talk about where that, because the point you've been making all the way through here is actually the money isn't going where it needs to go. Look, I, I think the Chancellor and I are in complete agreement on the importance of stimulating private investment mm -hmm. and creating a more enabling environment for private investment and that that's got many structural aspects. I suspect everybody on this panel would agree. I think the Chancellor and I are, I'm glad to see, very much in agreement on the importance of uh, public uh, investment. I think with, in the American uh, context, I think that the right investment strategies are actually win-win-win, that by growing the economy, they grow the tax base, which collects more revenue and substantially pays for themselves. And look, we're gonna fix Kennedy Airport someday. Yeah. And so making that investment today removes a future fiscal burden. So I see much less need to impose on, to impose cutbacks on people who are very vulnerable Absolutely. right now in the American context than the Chancellor sees but you've not in been the a European, fan. in the British context. But you've not of course, been I, would a fan. I, would, I would recognize. But you've not been a fan of UK austerity, and that's on the record. It is a fair comment that I have, that is, an, that is uh, uh, that is an entirely fair comment. I think that uh, I think I think the diff I think the difference um, would be that uh, the chancellor highlights the similarities and the risks associated with the other countries in Europe, mm. and I would see Europe's uh, difficulties in those increases in bond yields as centrally related to the fixed exchange rate the absence of a central bank and the uncertainties that would be created if, for example, a U.S. state were to pursue a massive fiscal expansion. And so my way of thinking about uh, this would be quite different. I've been very gratified to see uh, the growth in uh, Britain in, the last, uh, in uh, the last months. On the other hand, if you look if you compare, for example, the United States and Britain, it was a long time ago that we exceeded, several years, not too, a couple of years ago, that we exceeded our previous peak GDP. That's something that is still being sought uh, in Britain. And so I think it does need to be we recognized. A, yeah, we did have a much deeper fall in GDP. And for a banking sector that is the same size as the US is, but in an economy a fifth or a sixth the size, you know, the impact of the financial crisis was even greater in the United Kingdom than it was in, in the States. So you know, we have come, we, we ha you know, the Great Recession in the UK was, had an even greater effect, and we were one of the worst affected of any of the major Western economies. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why you've, the deeper the valley you're in, the more rapidly you are able to grow. But despite the best efforts of our moderator, George, we probably have a common, we probably so, have a common interest in stressing our points of agreement yes. rather than our points of, uh, ra rather than our points of, rather than our points of disagreement. And I think uh, they are the importance of uh, generating demand uh, through 
increased investment. So, uh, I want to move on. They are Larry. also just one, just one, one thing. Very quickly. Are also, what in the Japanese context is called, uh, and I suspect Mr. Kuroda would mm. agree here, yeah. the third arrow policies mm. Mm. of uh, and that's where structural I, reform. And, mm. and I want to bring this in because mm. um, so yeah. far the mm. message I have received is mm. that the central banks are like the fire brigade. Mm. They turn up. They put out the fire mm. um, and then gradually they pull away mm. as they've damped down the flames mm. and then the construction team comes in, mm. supported in part by the government, and rebuilds the house mm. after mm. the fire damage. Now, if that is correct, there's something I misunderstand about the Japan. Japanese experience mm -hmm. because the way that you tried to deal with your crisis mm. many years ago was to send the builders in first, mm. even knowing that the flames were still there, mm. licking up the sides of the building. Mm -hmm. um, and that didn't seem to work. Mm -hmm. And of course that phrase, mm -hmm. roads to nowhere, bridges to nowhere, <laughs> became very mm -hmm. relevant. So is Japan's monetary policy mm -hmm. tactic different, mm -hmm. and if it's different, mm -hmm. what does that do in terms of helping us shape our understanding of the future mm -hmm. for monetary policy? Uh, I understand uh, uh, our Prime Minister Abe <coughs> delivered his speech uh, arguing that uh, so-called Abenomics uh, have been successful. Uh, Abenomics uh, consists uh, uh, of uh, uh, monetary easing, uh, fiscal, with, with flexible respect, fiscal policy. I, I don't want to just revisit yeah. this. I'd like to just focus on going forward. Structural reforms. Now, the government has already uh, started uh, fiscal consolidation. And uh, it made uh, quite clear that the government uh, aims at uh, halving uh, primary deficit by 2015 and completely eliminate uh, primary deficit by 2020. And uh, fiscal uh, 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 program is on track. So, and so actually this year. So let, let's government, just get the point of differentiation yeah, here. So you yeah. disagree with Larry Summers, actually, because uh, the government can fiscally consolidate yeah. while the central bank stimulates. So you do not I, need I, the kind I, of construction think, or investment in education that Larry's talking about. You have about. to uh, uh, see the f Japanese government fiscal policy in greater detail. The Japanese fiscal policy consists of two parts. In the short run, the government provides stimulus through public investment uh, and tax credit and so on and so forth. But at the same time, in the medium to long run, the government is determined to consolidate uh, fiscal position, uh, reducing uh, and eventually eliminating uh, the uh, primary deficit by 2020. So the second allo, so-called flexible fiscal policy, I think has been successful. I mean, initially providing fiscal stimulus yeah. and uh, yeah. starting, already starting fiscal consolidation process to, to Looking at the economy is on track to, and to borrow a phrase, close to, 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 to borrow a phrase mm -hmm. from a famous economist, yeah. in the long run we're all dead. Yeah. Um, so if you're saying in the long run, <laughs> yeah. you know that fiscal consolidation takes yeah. place. And yeah. This is a bait and switch. The uh -huh. Japanese government uh -huh. needs the confidence of the markets uh -huh. to consistently uh -huh. drive down treasury prices here uh -huh. and maintain uh -huh. stability even as uh -huh. it stimulates. Uh -huh. um, so my my question really uh -huh. is, do. You, uh, are you rock solid in your belief mm -hmm. that the market mm. will continue to buy mm. the story you're selling? Mm -hmm. Or is it only the fact that you mm -hmm. have such significant domestic holdings mm -hmm. that you don't need to, to think about what foreign market participants do with JGBs? Again, I mean, I don't uh, really disagree with Larry Summers or Chancellor of Spawn. I mean, in the short run, the government can provide fiscal stimulus. But in the medium to long run, they must consolidate fiscal position. And the Japanese uh, fiscal uh, position is, is in a serious situation. So that the government has already started fiscal consolidation. And this fiscal consolidation program must be, as you are alluding, must be credible. Otherwise, certainly, uh, market uh, uh, could at any time uh, reduce holding of uh, JGBs, uh, 
raising uh, long-term interest in Japan and so on and so forth. So the government has a credible <coughs> fiscal consolidation program, and so far, uh, so far, uh, the program is on track. Excellent, thank you. I want to move on <laughs> and I want to talk a little bit about bubbles because inevitably now we're talking about exits. A lot of this to do is to do with making sure that we, yeah. we keep a lid on bubbles or we head them off or burst them before they become a serious problem again, knowing the experience that we've all come through. Um, Governor Jordan, if I can just start with, or President Jordan, if I can start with, with you on this, because um, you have used um, other tools to try to rein in excessive property market speculation. Mm. And this has not been the big hammer of interest rates. This has been about bank capital buffers, and that's been a way of trying to micromanage the property market, where we do see now in some economies quite bubbly behaviour in terms of price rises. I think the UK was 8%. Was it the price rise across the UK? Much higher in London, of course. Parts of the US, high double digits. So how do we head off the bubbles before they start? Do we have to look to things like macro prudential tools like this, given what we know about the weakness of the banking sector? We're encouraging the banks to lend. At the meantime, we're also using tools like this to rein in their activity. Well, macroprudential tools uh, become very important. Uh, Chancellor Osborne already alluded to that uh, a minute ago. In Switzerland as well, we built up a concept, uh, a strategy for macroprudential. Now, every country is a little bit different. And in our situation, you have very low rates. And for a couple of years, you have now a very strong housing market. We have also mortgage growth that is above average, above uh, nominal GDP growth. And given the fact that monetary policy, the key interest rate tool, is not available, you have to use a complement, a complementary in instrument, and these are the macroprudential uh, tools. And now we uh, used, uh, not for the first time, we already used that a year ago, and now we increased the, the counter-cyclical capital buffer to 2%. The hope is that that will uh, have two impacts. One is uh, making the banking system stronger, and on the other hand, also have the incentive not uh, to, to provide as much uh, mortgage credit as in the past. So to make mortgages relatively more expensive vis-a-vis -vis other, other credit. But every country is in a, a little bit in a different situation. If you do not have a housing bubble and you have a, a credit crunch, then obviously the macroprudential tools are uh, not necessary. So you have to really make a judgment on the overall situation, whether they make sense or not. Charles Osborne, are we going to see some of these tools implemented in the UK? in the near future, i.e. this year, yeah. given that you've already pulled back on some of the funding for lending yeah. programs directed at the housing market. Well, is it time now, given where we are in house price inflation, to start mm -hmm. dampening down the animal <clears throat> spirits? Well, that, you know, that is a call for our Financial Policy Committee in the Bank of England, and we've created, you know, this is a brand new arrangement. And uh, they have already started some of that process. So you, you just uh, alluded to our funding for lending scheme, which was, uh, it, it helped to bring bank spreads down. Uh, they have withdrawn that scheme for future mortgages. But they also did something else in December, which you know, didn't get a huge amount of press, but they tightened up mortgage approval standards as well. So they've got a whole range of uh, tools. And I think, you know, inevitably, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, complaining about this, it's just a fact of life. Everyone in the UK and, and here, they're focused on interest rate moves. You know, and, uh, you know, I can... I can see that, but actually there are a whole other range of tools that the Bank of England has now. And I think one of the lessons of the crisis has been you do need to bring all these things together, as we have done, into the central bank. Um, you know, we have bank regulation now in the central bank. We have macro prudential tools in the central bank. And of course, we have monetary policy in the central bank. And it, ultimately, the attempt to separate those functions out uh, fell down during the crisis. Uh, so that coordination exists. And I think, you know, rather immodestly, I think the Bank of England and the macro prudential framework in the UK is second to none. I think we have led the world in the, that innovation. Uh, and I think the value of that will be seen as the recovery picks up. So uh, you've mentioned this many times, the, the size of the toolbox and the many mm. tools available. Um, I just want to be very clear here. Um, is this the... Um, reply, if you like, to those scribblers overnight who were talking about the, the forward... I, I brought this up, I bring this up again, no apologies, yeah. that forward guidance 
is actually a significant failure. I mean, you've seen the copy as the same as I have. Um, uh, is this your no, message to them? You just that. want to reject no, I, that. I completely reject that uh, forward guidance is a failure. Uh, you know, I think what the Bank of England has done is provided clear communication, supportive monetary policy that has assisted, alongside the government's efforts, a very strong now set of data in the United Kingdom. If you take our job creation numbers, you know, if they were in the US, if you, you know, if you, they are equivalent in the US to five or 600,000 jobs a month. Uh, you know, we have had a rapid fall in unemployment. I can't see that that's a failure of economic policy making in the UK. And, and I think it's sustainable precisely because we have both the credible monetary framework, but it sits alongside a credible fiscal framework which comes down to the difficult decisions does, that does, the government Does the quality of those jobs matter, though? I mean, the, Sorry, it's, you... does the quality of those jobs matter? I mean, there's a yeah. lot of talk that those jobs are for estate agents or in other service sector positions that right. maybe are not at, or not perceived by economists to be as productive for right. the long-run growth of the UK. Well, I think you're being a bit unfair on estate agents, but the uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, for, rather encouragingly, in the in the United Kingdom, we're now seeing uh, manufacturing for the first time, you know, pretty much in my lifetime, uh, starting to grow and uh, good jobs being created there. Uh, of course, I want to make sure that uh, in as much as these things are within my power, that uh, there are good jobs, people have good careers. I took the, uh, I, mean, I said what I said about the minimum wage, uh, precisely because I thought that the economy was in a state where we could afford to see the real value of the minimum wage restored, <coughs> precise decisions for our low pay commission. But, but you know, these things are all, you're only able to even have this discussion if you've got a recovering economy and you've taken the difficult decisions that get you there. Um, Mr. Tombini, let me, let me bring you in. Do you think Brazil has taken the difficult decisions? Stubborn inflation um, sets you out from most of the other representatives that we have on the panel in terms of your economy. Do you think the tough structural decisions have actually been made to make your monetary tools work? Well, I think, uh, as, as I said before, Jeff, uh, we are close to full employment as we speak. So going forward, we need to develop new source of growth for Brazil. And, and we see some rebalancing as we speak. From the supply side, we see some more uh, better conditions for uh, manufacturing in Brazil. Unit labor costs has been reduced by 10% last year, including through the price of energy, through the payroll tax deductions, and also through the moving of the Brazilian exchange so, rate. So 2% growth in the third quarter is good enough? No, no, it's not good enough. I mean, I think we have to, to, do, to do more uh, going forward. And, and I think the government has a, a wide range in supply side agenda. We have a huge program of uh, uh, revamping infrastructure in Brazil. We have now six uh, international airports under construction. We have uh, uh, big games coming up. Uh, we have a lot of emphasis on education going forward. So I think the agenda should be one pro growth. Uh, supply side agenda, and I think the, the agenda is, is very well uh, organized in this direction. So going forward, I think uh, this is it. But let me just talk a little bit about macroprudential, because yep. macroprudential, we have deployed those, those tools in Brazil, and we were able to sort of bring credit growth to a sustainable level in the last couple of years. We have been able to so reduce anxiety in some important areas of the credit growth market using macroprudential. Yes. But macroprudential should be used for financial stability purposes, we have to separate macroprudential from uh, monetary policy as far as uh, monetary stability is concerned going forward. Uh, it's hard to believe the hour is nearly over, but I, <clears throat> I just have uh, a last opportunity to run along this panel. Every year, this event sets the agenda, <laughs> I think, in terms of uh, risks and rewards anticipated for full year uh, 2014 in this case. Um, Conspicuous by their absence on this panel is a representative from the European Central Bank and perhaps someone from the Bank of China, two areas of the world that are seen as um, th threats, if you like, to stability through 2014. Um, since they're not here, we can talk freely about them. <laughs> so if I could perhaps just run along the panel here and ask you to think about those two parts of the world and whether they represent challenges to the exit that we've talked about here mm -hmm. and a normalization of strategy. Uh, Chancellor Osborne, can I start with you? Well, I, I would say you know, the main external risk for the United Kingdom is still the very weak 
uh, economies <coughs> on the continent. I mean, not universally weak, but there are still far too many of them. And I think the big challenge this year is you know, what can we do to try and alleviate pretty desperate situations in, in some of those uh, Eurozone economies? Well, the ECB some... could start buying aggressively well, in the market, couldn't well, it? Well, you know, pursue I, QE. I, I don't do you recommend I don't they follow that English strategy? I'm not going to talk about what the ECB should do, but you know, that remains. You know, it's a tragedy, the levels of unemployment and youth unemployment in, in some of our near neighbours, and of course has a big impact on us because they're big export markets for us. Uh, in China, look, I mean, I, I was there fairly recently. I think the, you know, the challenge I'd say there is that there's a lot of uh, good talk there about economic reform, and they had their plenum, and, and as much as we can gather, you know, committed themselves to a, a set of economic reforms. I think we all just now want to see that delivered by, yeah. by the new Chinese government. Okay, Mr. Kuroda. I think uh, the Eurozone economy uh, has uh, bottomed out, and this year it could uh, grow 1% plus, uh, something like that, and next year economic growth can accelerate. So although some economists in the Eurozone uh, argue that there is a danger of uh, the zone going uh, into deflation, I don't think it's likely. Uh, and Partly because the uh, economy is picking up, and partly because inflation expectations are fairly well anchored around 2%. Okay. Now, China, uh, again, I don't think the uh, Chinese economy has uh, any uh, big risks in, in the short run this year, next year. Because the government, uh, policymakers, do understand the need to reform the economic system, including the financial system. Okay. But at the same time, they do understand the need to maintain relatively high growth, 7.5% or something like that. Well, let's move the, the, this along the panel. Larry Summers, if I can ask you to be brief, you don't have to cite these two as your uh, greatest threat for 2014, but uh, feel free to pick out something else if you choose to. Can I ask for your comment? Europe, Europe and China certainly face a full set of challenges. I worry about macroprudential complacency. Governments that have never successfully forecast a recession a year in advance, that missed the 2007 financial crisis, that missed the 1987 stock market crash, that missed the Latin American debt crisis, and missed much more. I worry about how well macroprudential can really work, though it's an attempt worth making. And I think much greater emphasis needs to be placed on making a system that is safe for ignorance and error. And that means emphasis on capital requirements. That means emphasis on liquidity. That means emphasis on strengthening the robustness of the system. Excellent. The last time we had a great emphasis on macro prudential, it was Spain's counter-cyclical capital requirements that we're going to protect against the Spanish real estate bubble. That didn't work so well. Uh, Mr. Tombini, briefly. Yeah, well, I think one issue that hasn't been uh, discussed so much lately is the fact that this exit is unsynchronized this time around. You see some more advancement in the, in the area, mm. in the US and the UK. Mm. But then when you look at Japan and Europe, you don't see synchronicity mm. uh, going forward, which is good from one perspective. So we don't have a vacuum cleaner in terms of uh, uh, resources being uh, sort of attracted to uh, the advanced world. I mean, you have areas still uh, in the uh, unconventional mode. But on the other hand, you might have more volatility in the exchange rate since those moves don't seem to be uh, synchronized going forward. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Well, obviously for us, uh, Europe will be key. But that was already mentioned. Another key risk is really financial markets. So when suddenly we have a loss of conf confidence again, with big flows in and out uh, safe havens, that obviously would put us again in a very difficult situation. It's been a, a great pleasure to have you all with us here for this live CNBC conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it, and can we show our appreciation for our <laughs> panelists, please?